Hi, I'm Mike Morse. Welcome to Open Mic. Today's episode, we have Chris Hansen from Have a Seat with Chris Hansen, a very popular YouTube channel. He's very active on Twitter, Cameo, all things, and he's uh, was on our show, episode eight. We're now in our 50s, and it's really exciting to have him, have him here today. So welcome, Chris Hansen. Joining us this morning is Mike Morse and Corey's Top 30. Mike Morse. Mike Morse is in here to tell us about the backpack giveaway. Yeah, yeah, adapt and adapt and change things up a little bit every year. Hi, welcome to another episode of Open Mic. I'm Mike Morse, and I'm really excited to have Chris Hansen back on the show today. Chris was here episode eight on Open Mic, and now we've done over 50 episodes, and it was one of our biggest uh, episodes that we had. And I think almost probably more viewers watched episode eight than, than anything else. So... Actually, Chris, you helped me uh, get started, so I want to first of all so say thank you and welcome back to Open Well, Mike. it's my pleasure, and it's really nice to see how well this show has done on so many different levels and, thank you. and you know the way it's worked out and all the great guests you've had on. Well, we're trying. We're trying to be like, uh, have a seat with Chris Hansen <laughs> and uh, duplicate that. We're having fun doing it. Um, we've done some really good episodes lately with the chief of police of Detroit. He's great. Um, Love Chief Craig. We've, we're doing some stuff on wrongful convictions and exonerations, which are really moving and hard shows and uh, getting into a lot of meat. So we're having fun, though. We're That's having great. fun. You know, Chief Craig was on my show during the COVID crisis when he was just recovering yes. from, from having COVID himself. And he's an interesting guy on a lot of different levels. I first met him 30 years ago in Los Angeles. No kidding. I was a reporter for Channel 4 here. And other police departments around the country were cherry-picking our highly trained officers because there were threats of layoffs. So we went to three different cities, Dallas, Portland, and L.A., to see what it's like to be a cop in these three cities that were poaching Detroit police officers who had been trained. So we get assigned to a sergeant named James Craig in Los Angeles. Wow. And we ride with him all day, and we became pals. I just liked him. He was a great cop, a great guy. And all those years later, this was probably 1990, 91, right around the LA riots. So he's got experience there. And I asked him at the time, I said, would you ever go back to Detroit? He said, probably not. <laughs> well, 30 years later, he's the chief and somebody found that video and it got viral oh, on the internet because awesome. he said he wasn't coming back. Well, he brings up the Rodney King riots <laughs> often. And, and, now yeah, that he was there. Dealing, and now that he's dealing with the Detroit protests, I'm mm -hmm. not going to call them riots no. because Detroiters didn't have it. They wouldn't take it. They were they were going to protect their city. But he uh, deserves a lot of credit for the leadership. He's, he's great. He's, for, he's, uh, he's at the cutting edge of law enforcement, and uh, he's a wonderful guy. I'll bet pe if people put bets out there, they would think that Detroit would have had some unrest. You would think so. And what I found interesting, and I know you know this, and I know the chief has talked about it, was you know the vast majority of people causing trouble in Detroit during the otherwise peaceful protests were outside of Detroit. He pointed that they out often Detroit during residents. our interview. Yeah. And uh, I think more to come on that, but he, he's at a large percentage were from yeah. outside of Detroit. So the last time we formally spoke, I know you and I talk often, but, but on, on a, a podcast, you know, it was all Onision all the time. And uh, you call him the psycho Brad out of uh, Seattle that you and I went to visit Absolutely. in January of 2020, which was a, an interesting trip out to Seattle. It certainly was. Um, uh, we, we made some um, some videos out there and, and saw you knocking on his door, and, and then he uh, filed a, a complaint against you where we had to hire lawyers in Seattle to get that dismissed, which was done fairly easily. Um, but since January, um, I want to talk to you about what's been going on with that investigation. Um, I know the police in every department, in every uh, city around this country has kind of had to slow down because of COVID. Absolutely. Um, now that COVID is hopefully ending, they're dealing with peaceful protests, hopefully some rioting. Um, so people like Onision are taking a back seat to police investigations. And I'm curious if that's what's happening in Seattle. If you know, catch us up. Well, from the time I knocked on his door when you and I were in the Seattle-Tacoma area, um, 
to now, there has been a lot of activity in that investigation. The Sheriff's Department in Pierce County, with which we dealt, um, has continued its investigation. They put together a hotline, an email for information from victims. It's been very active. The detectives have been gathering that information. They have interfaced with the FBI with a, in a task force based in, in Tacoma. The FBI has obtained cell phone and computer from one of the victims in the case, Sarah, and it has done a cart examination of the cell phones and um, the laptop. And they're putting that information together. And that was moving along pretty quickly with priority. The, the FBI doesn't take things like that to do a card examination unless there's an open investigation. Sure. We had the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, Detective Vaughn, confirming the investigation, the existence of it. We knew based upon our door knock that there were some 19 police calls, complaints of potential criminal activity at Onision's address in 2019 alone, up to and including the fact that his two-year-old daughter at yeah. the time fell out of a second-story window, sure. and all the things that you and I know are related to that. So COVID hits. One of the first hotspots, Seattle, Tacoma. Mm -hmm. They're overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed. They start to get back to normal. I mean, I was talking to Ed Troyer at the Sheriff's Department. They had at one point 17, 18, 19, 20 of their own first responders in, in public safety, either fire or paramedic or, or sheriff's deputies, out wow. with COVID-19. Terrible. So then that happens, and now we have the protests. Look what's going on in Seattle. An entire precinct has been taken over by protesters. So where does the Onision investigation sit? It's active. It's happening. But world events have gotten in the way. And this happens. But you're still you're still hopeful based on the oh, things they'll, that they'll you're be, hearing they'll off be the activity. Record. Things that I'm hearing, the knowledge I have, what I know, what I've seen that's been transmitted, that very likely constitutes the transmission of inappropriate material to a minor, the engagement that occurred at the residence where I knocked on the door. Those things will add up, in my opinion, to be a criminal complaint. And bring some justice to the victims. I think so. We're, you know, in contact all the time. We talked about the Onision show, um, the Onision investigation on the show this week. Um, and he continues to be active in a lot of different ways. I mean, you, you can't make this up, Mike. And I know you've been following it as well. Um, and just being on that investigative trail out there. I mean, it, it, it's, it's stunning. What's his latest? What's the latest, uh, his latest gig? I know he's not putting out YouTube videos anymore. He's charging people to see his content. But according to some of my sources, he's, he's putting out some really disturbing stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's on OnlyFans, which is an adult site where you can buy into people and subscribe to people's content. He's on Discord, where people subscribe to everything from a VC, a voice chat, voice call, to a movie night, to, you know, private chats. You know, there are multiple revenue streams that he has based upon content, some complicated to put together, some not so complicated. What do these things cost? Do you know? Does Ryan know? Ryan probably you know how has much? a little better hand, but it could probably be anything from $4.99. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. CD I'm, rooms from yeah. time to time. I've got my own OnlyFans, you know. Check, no, I'm kidding. So I, I think they're tier subscriptions. So, you know, the subscriptions are, I don't know exactly what the prices are, but like Chris said, you know, you can get a voice chat. So wait, wait, hold on. What does that mean? You pay you pay you pay Onision money so he'll voice chat with you? Yes. Yeah, so or watch a movie with you? I don't understand what this is. I've never I've never heard of Discord. They well Discord's different than OnlyFans. So 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 Discord is 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 a, a voice chat where you go into a server and you can can interact and chat with the person or persons that run the server. Um, so that was was one place. Well, what's that, movie night mean? You sit and watch a movie with Onision? 
I think so. I, <laughs> well, I, you, if it's ten bucks, I'll, I'll pay it. Go, 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 go! Watch a movie with him. Tell me what happens. Can I delegate and elevate? <laughs> no, you do it. <laughs> I want you to do it, or you can give it to Rocky. Uh, um, but that sounds that sounds uh, that sounds interesting. So that's how he's making his money. It sounds like it is. And and uh, this past week we had a guest on who had infiltrated the Discord and actually had a recording of some of the interaction between. Um, Onision and a fan, and and by the next morning, um, Onision took that Discord down. Was it inappropriate, or why would he take it down? I don't know. It's borderline because it, what it shows is his attitude towards some of these people who actually pay him for access. And Ryan, you listened to this as well, but he it's a it's almost like he abuses these people. And these people are are just so hungry to be a part of what he's doing or follow him, but it's he he's becoming, for a lot of different reasons, a digital vagabond. And Ryan, you know, came up with that that saying the other day because he you know he keeps moving to different platforms to try to be relevant and to you know create a revenue stream. Whatever happened with uh, the interview? So. Refresh my memory. We offered, you know, he he contacted you to be interviewed, demanded hundreds of thousands of dollars for an interview. Three hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. We didn't write him a check for that amount. <laughs> um, and then I started getting inter- I started getting uh, emails directly from him saying, "Let's do an interview. Let's do an interview." I'm like, "Great, Chris wants to interview you. Name the time and place. We'll be there." And then he wanted to do it live on his channels where we would have no protection and you wouldn't be protected and he could manipulate it as we've seen him do right. with interviews. Obviously, well, he, a professional journalist like you, we do, can't do that. Right, but we've also seen him engage in targeted harassment of me especially and to some extent you because sure. you were out there. Absolutely. So, I mean, we, we, were, we wanted to do a real interview, a safe interview, for safe for everybody, uh, you know, pull no punches, ask some honest questions, and he has refused to date. He wanted to go live under an environment where he could control. And this is a guy who, you know, has done porn online. Fine, whatever, it's adult content. But I, not, I'm not going to have no. that on, my, on a show attached to my name. And you would do an interview with him in a neutral setting? Absolutely. With a real moderator that's, that, that, that was safe for everybody? Right. We don't even need a moderator. It's not right. a debate. It's right. an interview. If he wants to roll tape on it for his own reasons to use it, fine. But I'm, I'm not going to go live where he can make a mockery of it or do something that would be absolutely objectionable and inappropriate. Yeah. I mean, I think... What he'd want to do was do something live on my channel that was so obnoxious that could get us kicked off of YouTube. Which and I, I wouldn't put that past him. No, absolutely not. Um, Notwithstanding the fact that multiple victims came to me and said, please, please, please don't disrespect us by putting him on live and making a mockery of us. Yeah. So what am I supposed to do? No, it's not. It's, we don't trust him. He's no. not trustworthy. He has shown that. Um, well, we'll give him another shot, but in a dignified you know, setting where we have some measure of control. Okay, well, he knows how to get a hold of us if he wants to, to have a real interview with you, which, which would be interesting for his fans, I assume, and for uh, people who subscribe to your channel. Um, let's talk, and then I've been watching your channel. I, I know you, you've, you've been working hard on this Davi vanity case. So I've watched bits and pieces of it. And I just, for, for the people who watch my channel who may not be caught up on who he is, give me a brief or not brief understanding of who this Davi Vanader, vanity character is, please. Davi Vanity, a.k.a. Jesus Torres, started out as a presence on MySpace, Twitter, and he was this hairdresser who got a lot of attention for his look, what he was doing, a bit goth. He got into music. He was the front man for a group called Blood on the Dance Floor. They would travel with other bands, you know, goth-like, metal. 
and he developed a pretty serious following. And along the way, hundreds, thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of very young female fans who were going through a dark time in their life, who reached out because they could relate to Davi's message, who liked his makeup, who liked his look. And a lot of people came through this circle. Jeffrey Starr, who's a very successful makeup mega entrepreneur influencer. Um, Ash Costello, a musician. Um, several other people who have done well in this world. But along the way, he was able to groom, manipulate, and form relationships with 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old girls who fawned over him. And he was such an operator and such a groomer that in his wake, untold numbers of victims of sexual assault. And they're now all coming forward. And Mike, I have interviewed girls, now young women, from coast to coast and overseas who have been victimized by this guy. He's been investigated twice, once in Colorado, once in Florida. Charges were never brought. And we are now giving a voice to these young victims, survivors. If there are thousands of them, why haven't more gone to the police and come forward? And now they're talking to you, but what's going on with the police? I don't understand why he hasn't been charged with something. There are numerous investigations. The FBI. Current investigations. Current investigations. Because the statute of limitations has not run out on a lot of these cases based upon the state, based upon federal laws as well. So young women are filing charges. I think for a long time, some of these young women blamed themselves for putting themselves in the situation. They were there. They were at the merch table. They bought a T-shirt. They let Davi sign, you know, their breasts. And he knew how to target, manipulate. But let's not forget that 12, 13, 14 year olds can't consent. Exactly. They can't consent. No matter what. By law, they can't consent. Right. They could take off their shirt. He's still wrong for touching them or Absolutely. whatever else. Unquestionably. But is that what we're talking about, signing breasts? Or is no, it, does we're it talking about that? forced oral sex, violent activities that have, in multiple cases, left young women bleeding because of the way they were assaulted. And time after time after time, his attacks, his assaults, follow a template that is unmistakably Davi. And I've interviewed more than a dozen of these young women, and there are more to come. And without question, the MO is very similar, if not identical, in these cases. So where is he now? As far as we know, he's in Florida, central Florida, around Orlando. He doesn't really have a music presence. He's trying to rebuild a music career amidst all this. He has a social media presence where he still is in contact with vulnerable young women, girls 15, 16 years old. I have been given evidence that he's still grooming, still trying to set up meetings. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy how this went down. Mike. I mean, there's so much to this thing. I can't believe it. I mean, you had a situation where, in some cases, mothers were fans of the music, took the daughter to go see the show, and... Things got crazy rock and roll, and suddenly the daughter is involved with this guy. And he was good at manipulating families. Do you mean the mother in that case? No, I meant the daughter. So the, so the, uh, the mother's The also mother brought the daughter to the, to the show. And basically handed their daughter not, to... Not like they were buying the daughter. I mean, I know where you're going with that, and that's an that's a absolutely appropriate question. But it was more like, well, Davi wouldn't do that. But he, they and allowed then he it got, to happen. They, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not blaming the parent here necessarily, but he was that good of a groomer where he would gain the confidence of entire families. He would sleep in the, on the couches, you know, people would invite them into uh, their homes yeah. and, you know, he would, he would sleep on the couch, you know, I'm going to go over there and cut your hair. 
And then, you know, the next thing you know, he's he's in one instance sleeping on the couch and then sneaking into the girl's bedroom. How old is this character? He's about 34 now. And when this was happening initially in, you know, 2010, 2014, when it when it first started, he was, um, you know, well into his mid to late 20s. And, you know, some of these victims were as young as 10, 11 years old. I mean, there's the picture. I want to see what this. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I'm sure Rocky will put this up on the screen. But is is this who the character we're talking about? That's Donnie Vanity. Yeah. Okay, so I know Rocky will put that up. Um, Holy moly! So his band is defunct. Yes, people have moved on from Blood on the Dance Floor, and you know we've interviewed everybody from, you know, his victims to people who um, were his singing coach to people who helped him write music. So he he relied on all these people and sort of rode this wave of popularity for a number of years, made a bunch of money. Um, But all along the way, I mean, you hear these stories. He'd pick up one girl at the airport, you know, force her to have sex in a car, and then run off and meet another young woman and be on the phone with a third. I mean, it was, was, and, and these were, in some cases, violent attacks. So when did you start, when, when did you pick up his scent? Because it looks like uh, Spotify took his music off mm-hmm. um, back in 2000, early 2019, 2018, because of the sexual assault allegations. Mm-hmm. So this has been going, this, this has been, this has been going on for, for a long time. I mean, we're talking about back to 2013 uh, in the, Colorado investigation that ultimately did not lead to charges for a lot of different reasons. Um, and the way he operates does not always leave uh, a great DNA uh, piece of evidence. And so when there is a delay in reporting or there's alcohol involved or in some cases drugging of alcohol, you know, it complicates these things. And that's all in play here. I mean, he's put out a video years ago where one of the young victims was drugged and was doing suggestive things on this video. And in spite, when she didn't do as he said, they released the video. He'd make an interesting uh, interview. Have you tried to uh, sit, take a seat or have him take I've a seat with you? I've reached out to uh, Davi and... Um, have not gotten a response. I know that he's watching some of the shows. Ryan and I know that he's in the, the chats. Uh, people have identified him. And as far as you know, with the police investigations, they're ongoing currently. There are. There are currently ongoing investigations. Do you in know if Florida. he's been interviewed by you know police I'm, yet? I'm unaware of a police interview yet. But that would be consistent with the authorities gathering evidence and then ultimately calling him in. Well, if he wants an interview, he can contact us, and we'll, we'll make that happen. Absolutely. Um, so he can tell his uh, side of the story and whether these allegations are true or not. Um, I've never heard of his band, and before this, really, I haven't heard of him. But how did you get, how did you, you know, did somebody come to you? Did somebody say? It was a collective request from people on social media. Uh, once I got going in, in the, um, the Onision investigation, there was a steady drumbeat on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You need to take a look at Davi Vanity. And some of the potential victims and those who are in contact with the potential victims started to reach out to our moderators and said, you know, you should look into it. And so we contacted another content creator who had been on the story. We had some people on to talk about it, including one of his former bandmates, Javon Monroe, who pretty much laid it out. And then suddenly, you know, it's out there. Huffington Post was really at the forefront of this. Okay. Um, and I've had, <coughs> um, I've had both of those reporters on. They put together about a year ago a dozen victims and then did a follow-up because there were so many more who came out of the woodwork. And they came to me and said, look, we've done some pretty aggressive reporting here. 
you know, we think you can take this to the next level. And so they've been very helpful. But I have to give a ton of credit to Huffington Post because the two reporters there, Sebastian and, and Jessalyn, really are the ones who got this rolling. I know that you've interviewed and come in contact with and investigated hundreds of predators in your career. Where does this guy lie in the uh, hierarchy? Davi Vanity, among the most prolific. I mean, literally, you're talking about a touring musician with a never-ending supply of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old victims. Now, when he was investigated in Colorado and Florida, he became a little more cautious. He would groom some of these young women um, until they turned 18. But even then, when there was a sexual encounter, it was often violent. Hmm. It was often non-consensual and certainly could constitute rape. It's, I mean, this is a side note. I mean, I have a 12-year-old daughter, and I've taken her to plenty of concerts, um, the Taylor Swifts of the world. I've sure. never experienced this, but even if I did experience something this horrific, allowing a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old daughter to be anywhere near him in his presence, I don't understand that. I'm not blaming parents, but I don't understand No, that. and you have to be careful about that, too. And, and I know what you're saying, and, and you know... I've taken my kids to concerts dozens of times over the years, if not a hundred times over the years. And yeah, you're careful, but not every family is set up the same way, you know, and, and sometimes kids do stuff on their own because they're coerced by a guy like Dobby Vanity. That's true. You've heard, you've heard the stories, you've watched the other documentaries. It happens. It's just, it's And scary. you have young victims who are afraid to tell their mom or dad. I had a woman on the show now, you know, well into her 20s who was victimized by Davi. Not even on a concert thing. It was a hairstylist thing. She wanted to get in the music industry. He was on his way in, but he was known as a hairstylist and, and sexually assaulted her. She was afraid to tell her father and didn't tell him until two days before she went on my show because she didn't want him to be surprised. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a hard that's thing to do. Deep. That's way deep. And, and, and these <laughs> women, mean, these women are suffering the consequences today from this. And you, you know, a, a 14, 15, 16 year old girl is not going to think like a 24, 25 year. That's why it's illegal to have sex with somebody that age. They can't process the information. They can't make decisions of consent. And so they carry this horrifying guilt. And I try to constantly remind them during these interviews. That it's not your fault. You got sucked into this vortex of fame and celebrity and music that you bought into for a second. And then because you were a kid, were victimized. And, you know, some of these women are still in therapy. It affects their long-term relationships. It affects their self-esteem. And now they're trying to get some sense of justice. And I'm going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until they get it. Good for you. Um, I'm sure they appreciate it. Hopefully the authorities down in Florida or wherever they're investigating, get them. Yeah, well, we, we've talked about this before off camera, off mic, about the Jeffrey Epstein case. I was thinking that. And I wasn't going to bring up the, the correlation, but I just watched his Netflix yeah, stuff, and it's absolutely. Florida, and it's like, it's coming back. Well, but go but ahead. The, make the, the, make the, the, re- the lesson here for me is that You know, earlier on in this thing, I had access to information to, this is after he served the year on the plea deal, that perhaps stuff was still going on, that perhaps the things were worse than suggested in the plea agreement, and we tried to fashion an investigative sting and try to infiltrate his world, and it became difficult, and we couldn't pull it off the way we wanted to. We got busy with other things, but it was the Miami Herald that kept chipping away and chipping away at that story and got victims to speak out. Because for a long time, he skated on this because, well, the girls were of age, money changed hands, you know. You're talking about Epstein Gray still. area stuff. Yeah, Epstein. Yeah. And so, so he, you know, he was able to skate on this and only do a year. $200. Uh... Yeah, this or and that for the, the massage. But, right. But ultimately, 
you know, this picture of human trafficking develops and the victimization of many, many young women. And so it was the Miami Herald. And when the U.S. attorney announced charges almost a year ago, he said, without the Miami Herald, we, not, we may not be here today, having just arrested Jeffrey Epstein on his, getting off his private plane in New York, coming back from Paris. So you were, you were, on, you were on Epstein's tail before it was in vogue, but you weren't able to pull it off because of lots of things. It wasn't, we couldn't pull it off the way we wanted right. to. And now you're on this Davi Vanity's tail and you don't want to, you don't want to let this one no, go. No, because, because that's the journalistic lesson of this mm-hmm. for both Onision, who, you know, you could argue is the Jeffrey Epstein of YouTube. And for Davi Vanity, who's the Jeffrey Epstein of the metal dark music world. And all you could do, because you don't have that badge, is to bring it to light and, and bring your information to the police. We'll give a voice to the victims, get inside the mind of a predator, prevent other people from becoming victims of a predator, and create an environment that encourages law enforcement to focus. All right. So... What else are you working on? What, I mean, you're busy. I know you're busy. Tell me what, uh, what's coming for your fans. Tell me what's coming next. Well, we would have already had a new predator investigation had it not been for the pandemic and the associated travel bans and things. So we have at least two new investigations in the works there. I believe we're going to be able to get out in the field in a month or so. Like old school predator investigations? We're doing some of those, yes. That's what you're talking about. Traditional. Yeah. Okay. Updated with technology and things like that. So we've got that. We've got another syndicated show in the works that's going to be very interesting, a crime-related show um, that I'll have more to talk about in the next couple weeks probably. And then the Onision investigation. And, you know, one of the interesting things that I found, and, you know, you and I talk about the relevance of YouTube and podcasts and and how that benefits what you do as a lawyer, what you do seeking justice in, in, in a media presence, what I do. What I found is that this YouTube medium can be an incubator for television projects. And it it's very attractive to the networks because they have that demographic that they want. I mean, if you ask your daughters, for instance, the difference between what they watch on network news and what they catch on YouTube, I can pretty much yeah. predict how that's going to break I don't down. think they watch network news. That's my point. I don't watch much. Um, yeah, they're, they're watching it on, on YouTube, and then you're going to the Netflix and uh, the Hulus and the Amazon Primes. I mean, that's, that's really the future. Right. And I know you're busy shooting cameos, and I think that that's an interesting thing for our viewers. If they want to meet you, <laughs> uh, they can go to cameo.com. You did not ask me to plug that, but I think those, I like the cameo. Well, you know uh, what? I like it. It's a great way to have fan engagement. It really is. And, and, and I've had a lot of fun doing it because, as you just mentioned, the top 10 list of horrific predators, I don't often get a chance to use my sense of humor. Which you have a good one. Well, I, in my own mind, I do. I think mm-hmm. I, you know, I crack myself up, but... The cameo thing has been very interesting because I've been able to have some fun in this medium, and I think it is reflected in the in the success of it. But it, it it's it's been great fun. It's, no, it's, I, it's I like I watch him. I saw that Mike Tyson recently came onto that platform. Yeah. There's a lot of sports players. I keep looking for the perfect time to to buy one and use one, and I just I haven't uh, yet. But I'm I'm you know there's there's. One of my daughters just graduated high school, and I was looking for a couple of her famous uh, stars. Oh, yeah. They're not on there yet, so I'm, I'm trying to. Well, they, they, everybody from you know, me to, to uh, you know the, the Shark Tank people to the Housewives of Beverly Hills, New York, and I mean it, it's 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 pretty funny. It, it's it's a it's a great thing, and I've watched you do some of them, and it's pretty easy, and you turn them around really quick, so it's a nice. Well, I think people want. You know, if they're going to do that, you know, they want response. Yeah. They want it's engagement. That's yeah. what it is. It's fan engagement, and it it lets it's a people good know. gift. It's a great gift. It's it's great fun. Well, Chris, thank you for the updates. My um, pleasure, Mike. And if uh, people watching this want to 
see you, hear you more. You, your main channel is Have a Seat with Chris Hansen on YouTube? YouTube.com slash Chris Hansen. Thank you for that clarification. That will be in the show notes. Uh, so Have a Seat we dropped. It's still have a seat with Chris Hansen, but we've got a, uh, a, a URL that if you go to youtube.com okay. slash Chris Hansen, it, it just goes right to his page. And, you know, everyone knows the, uh, the have a seat brand. That's, That's great. And you have an active Twitter account mm-hmm. that people can find you At on. Chris with. Hansen. Great. And any new merch that people can be finding? We do. We have some coming out and, and, uh, you know, we want to be sensitive to timing. We actually did a, uh, a run for charity where we said, have a seat six feet away. And so we, we all those proceeds went to City Harvest, which was kind of fun to do. That sounds great. And, but we've got some new stuff coming out in the next few weeks, yeah. All right, so we'll look for hats and T-shirts and that kind of fun stuff. Thanks, Ryan, for being here and filling in some of the blanks today. Absolutely. Always and thank Ryan's you, the man. And thank you, Chris Hansen, you. for being here. We really appreciate everything that you're doing and uh, especially being on our show. So thank you. Thank you for watching Open Mic. Today's episode with Chris Hansen was really interesting. Caught us up on the Onision stuff, the Davi Vanity stuff, the Peter Nygaard investigation. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, share it with your friends, like it, comment, and stay tuned for some more YouTube content. See you soon. You never know who you're going to see. Be one guy one-on-one my whole career. What you're going to hear. Got a lot of desperate people in the city. On my podcast, Open Mic. Find it where you find your podcasts.